Good morning, brothers and sisters, and welcome to Getting the Goods to Win Your UPS Grievance. Please put your name and local in the chat while we wait for others to join. Good morning, brothers and sisters, and welcome to Getting the Goods to Win Your UPS Grievance. Please put your name and local in the chat while we wait a few minutes for others to join in. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Welcome to Getting the Goods to Win Your UPS Grievance. Please put your name and local in the chat while we wait for others to join. Good morning, brothers and sisters, and welcome to Getting the Goods to Win Your UPS Grievance. Please put your name and local in the chat while we wait for others to join. Nice to see so many folks on a fine fall day here in October. All right. Guess we'll get started. For the sake of introduction, uh, my name is Greg Kerwood. I am a 19-year UPS Teamster a longtime steward and a member of the International Steering Committee of Teamsters for a Democratic Union. This webinar is hosted by UPS Teamsters United, which is a project, project of TDU. We just concluded a year-long fight to get a good contract at UPS, a fight that featured the first actual contract campaign in decades, spearheaded by the efforts of the rank and file. And we won what is ind indisputably the best contract we have ever seen at UPS. But that is only half the battle. The contract isn't worth the paper it's printed on if we, the rank and file members at UPS, don't enforce it. It is therefore imperative that we bring the same energy, the same commitment, and the same coordination that we brought to winning the contract to enforcing it in the workplace. And that is why we are here today. But before I introduce our workshop leader, I want to take a minute to briefly discuss TDU and our upcoming convention in Chicago. Since 1976, TDU has been working to make our union more democratic, to build rank and file power, and as in the case of today's seminar, to provide members with the tools they need to be effective Teamster leaders in the workplace. The high point of this work comes every year at the TDU convention, to be held from November 3rd to 5th in Chicago. At the convention, you will meet Teamster activists from around the country, have the opportunity to attend multiple educational seminars just like this one, and truly experience the solidarity of a rank and file movement. We will have many guest speakers, including IBT General President Sean O'Brien, General Secretary Treasurer Fred Zuckerman, and IBT Western Region Vice President Lindsay Doherty. TDU Convention is one of the most empowering experiences you will have as a Teamster. I cannot recommend it highly enough, and I hope to see you all there. Without further ado, it is my privilege to introduce Josh Pomerantz, Operations Director of Teamsters Local 804. Take it away, Josh. On my video. And good morning, Teamster family. Thank you so much for spending your Sunday morning here. Hopefully we'll be able to go through some things that are of value to you um, on the shop floor. This class is generally geared towards shop stewards and people who are hoping to run for shop steward. Um, this is probably helpful for business agents as well, but this is really uh, at the shop steward level. So there's gonna be a lot of information in this. Um, there is a lot of handouts that should be available to all of you. You do not need to follow along with those. I'm gonna be throwing up some of the handouts as we go through this, uh, but in your packet, you will see 
a few arbitrations. I think it's really helpful if you have the time to go through them in your own time, just to read through an arbitration, see how an arbitrator thinks, see how an arbitrator decides things. There's a couple of disciplinary arbitrations in there, and then there's a couple of contract interpretation arbitrations. The contract interpretation ones have to do with stewards' rights, um, and our national agreement gives stewards a lot of rights well beyond Weingarten, so it's really helpful for all of you guys to know how much power you really do have on the shop floor as a shop steward. Um, so what we're going to be going through today, um, by the agenda, we're going to be going through some common grievances. This is really going to stick to contract enforcement. Uh, we're, and we're going to go through some best practices to actually win those grievances. We're going to talk a little bit about broader strategies to win grievances, but also in terms of getting engagement out of your fellow union members on the shop floor, getting people to step up in enforcement. We're going to go through what needs to be in a written grievance. It's important for everybody to know that a grievance belongs to the union. The company cannot tell you that a grievance is written on the wrong form, that it has the wrong format. All of that is nonsense. You can write a grievance on a piece of toilet paper. It is valid as long as the correct information is in there. And that's what we're going to go through, what the important information needs to be in a grievance to be able to win it. We're going to be talking about the difference between winning a single grievance on its own and how to go about building and winning a grievance campaign. It's important to be able to have both. We're going to talk some about what the national grievance procedure is so that everybody understands what happens from the point of expressing an, a verbal grievance on the shop floor. And then every step, if it can't be settled and resolved, getting to national panel and if necessary, a national arbitrator and winning it there. But it's going to be the same grievance that you on the shop floor as a rank and file member or as a shop steward are filing up until a national arbitrator is deciding it. So we really want that first step grievance to be perfect. There's gonna also be a couple of Q and A sessions as we go through this. Um, to be honest, I'm used to giving this class at the TDU convention where there's a lot more interaction throughout. So hopefully y'all don't get sick of hearing my voice talking at you. Um, because there's gonna be Q and A sessions, what would be great is if you have a question that comes up at any point, go into that dialogue box at the bottom of your screen, type in your question. The wonderful folks over at TDU are gonna be going through those questions. There's likely gonna be you know, more than one of the same questions. So we will pick out kind of the, the best example of the type of question and I will do my best to answer it uh, during the Q and A sessions. Okay, turning to some common grievances, but also the broader strategy that goes along with it. Like all of you have probably experienced on the shop floor, there's a real tie between contract interpretation, contract grievances, and discipline, right? Those two things interact in a lot of ways. Um, the two most common types of violations that UPS will do, right? Supervisors working, um, particularly inside the facilities. The company violates this language in every building, in every center, across the country, every day. Supervisors are violating our contract by doing our work. The hope, right, is that in this last contract, we were able to raise part-time wages. And hopefully that is going to change the model that UPS has inside their facilities, where right now they just plan on working supervisors and they plan on people not showing up, people not staying for their entire shift. And then they get to juice their own numbers by pretending the work first they have is doing all the work when they have their part-time supervisors working constantly. So how do we address supervisors working? It is going to be a very intensive campaign. But how is UPS going to respond? 
They are going to go after people for attendance, without a doubt. And that is something you have to keep in mind. Um, in terms of the people that are going to be filing the grievances, the company will be going after them for attendance. And the reality is, is if we want to stop supervisors from working, people need to start coming to work. So all of that is very intensive and long-term and complicated, and we all have to be prepared for it. We have to inoculate our members for it. But what's going to be important is that for attendance, the company has to follow progressive discipline. And we're going to get to that. So as we all change the culture at UPS, right? On the one side, supervisors are going to stop working. On the other side, our members are gonna to need to come to work. So how do we do and stay at work, right? We have good guarantee language. People need to work their full guarantee. So all of that needs to come together and we're all gonna to try to figure out how to do that together in a way um, that benefits the membership. The other one, this is more so out on the road, right? Excessive OT, nine five lists, all the people that got hired as 22 fours now have the opportunity to get on that nine five list. We need to get that excessive overtime down. We need to figure out how to get everybody on the nine fives list. This is going to push back on layoffs that are happening across the country. This is gonna push back on how they are pushing work to Saturdays instead of leaving it on Mondays. This is gonna to try to drive down that stops per car nonsense that's going on everywhere. But you gotta get people on these lists. You gotta enforce it. And we gotta bring down the paid day for real. What is the, how is the company gonna respond, right? They're gonna lie. They're going to harass and some of it is going to be real, right? So we are going to have to be good at defending against production discipline, methods discipline, and stealing time discipline, because that's what UPS does, right? They retaliate against us. They use that. But also, we need our members prepared for it, just like in an organizing campaign. We need to inoculate the people against what is going to happen. And also, right, you're going to gain credibility by telling people what UPS is gonna do before they do it. So we need to be ready for them to come after people for this disciplinary stuff. Um, for all of this, I want people to keep in mind kind of a three keys, almost like a pyramid for how winning a grievance is going throughout the process. And the three really important keys that you're gonna to need to keep in mind are, what is the remedy you are looking for? And when I'm talking about you, I'm talking about an individual grievance filer, but I'm also talking about the members you represent. What are you looking for? An easy example here is people getting on the 9-5 list. Because the 9-5 list gives a nice monetary remedy when it's violated. It also gives you the ability as a driver to hopefully not get excessive overtime. But people get on the 9-5 list for both reasons. Some people get on the 9-5 list because they want to get paid that overtime. They want that penalty. Other people actually want to work less overtime. Figure out who in your membership wants what and help them get it. Because it doesn't do a ton of good to get the person who's in it for the money less overtime. It doesn't do people a lot of good who want to be home with their family to be left out on the road, but be getting more money. So understand what the remedy is that people are looking for, and that's going to affect how you go about getting it. The other corner of the pyramid is what are your facts, right? This goes for any type of grievance. Who is the person? What's actually happening on the road? Some of this is going to change and develop as you're investigating grievances, as you're adding people to a campaign. You just need to have a handle on your facts. You need to have a handle on how that's going to affect your remedy. The other cornerstone of any campaign is going to be your leverage, right? And that is really working in conjunction with those other two corners of this pyramid, right? 
You are building leverage by getting more people involved. You're building leverage by increasing the penalty on them. You're finding other ways to build leverage. You might be losing leverage though too at different points, right? Are people dropping out? Did something unexpected happen with your fact scenario? If that happens, that might affect the remedy you're looking for. Maybe money's falling off of it. Maybe money's getting increased. You need to be aware of all of that because also that might be when you are deciding to pull the trigger on settling your grievance. Maybe your manager has been offering you 75 cents on the dollar on this pay grievance. And early on, you're saying, no, I need to get 100 cents on the dollar, 95 cents on a dollar. But you know, before your manager knows that people are dropping out. So maybe you do want to strike now. Maybe you're realizing that you were initially thinking of taking 60 cents on the dollar because it didn't seem like that good of a grievance. But now you're getting more facts. So you're not ready to settle for that. Just keep all that in mind. So let's dig into it a little bit more. Supervisors working, right? This is especially on the inside and it happens on the road too, but I'm really gonna be focusing on the inside here. We want to stop supervisors from doing our work. By preventing supervisors from doing bargaining unit work, you are going to get more jobs, right? You are gonna get more money in all of the funds you are going to protect the job. This is what needs to happen. We need to stop supervisors from working. There's also a ton of money on the table for supervisor working grievances. I'm gonna be focusing on national language throughout this because we all have different supplements across the country, but we have really, really strong national language. What Article 3.7 of the National Master says is that they have to exhaust all local practices first, and then it kind of lays out what those local practices should be if it's different where you are. Um, I just saw someone put in the chat that supervisors haven't touched a package and you're barn in over a year. That's amazing. Let's get that everywhere. That's really incredible, and we want to see that everywhere. Um, I'm excited to know how you pulled that off, to be honest, because that's great. Um, but they have to exhaust your local practices first. Go to your supplement, get familiar with it, um, but we're gonna go through it. In almost every supplement, they have to basically exhaust all means first. And what does that mean? That in almost every shop, that means there's gonna be some sort of call and list, right? It's gonna be also offering overtime to the people who are already there, and it's going to be really using who you have. Um, we have one arbitrations in local 804. I could share it at different points, but, but it's been out there before failing to sufficiently staff the workforce. Arbitrators have ruled that that is not a good enough excuse for supervisors to work. And that's really important for you guys to understand what that means. When they say we can't hire anyone, we can't find enough people. That is not an excuse that will get your supervisor working grievance denied. Because as everybody knows, like during peak season in different places, they could always put in an MRA. They can always raise wages. And guess what? That magically leads to more people taking the job. So that's the response to them when they say we can't hire anybody, offer them more money. Okay. One thing that I want you guys to all think about when they have these call-in lists, and this is a grievance campaign that can work really well, especially with the higher pay rates and especially with the quadruple time penalty. If you are working inside, if you are an inside shop steward, set up a network with drivers on the call-in list. What does that mean? First, you are going to your supervisor and saying, or manager really, do we have a call-in list, right? When they are working, we need to have a call-in list. Grieve that until they establish a call-in list of drivers, full-timers, whomever. But you want it to really be full-timers, preferably drivers. Ask to see that list. 
You have the absolute right to know who's on it. The top four people on that list get their phone numbers because here's what you can do, right? And if you can coordinate with those people, maybe, you know, as they're coming in in the morning and you're leaving, however you want to coordinate it, however you can coordinate it, figure out how you can know who the top three to four people on that call on the star. Four o'clock in the morning, when you know they are not actually going to call these people in and you see supervisors working, you can ask them, did you call in the people off the call and list? Whether they say yes or no, it's probably going to be BS. That's fine. But hear them say that they will or have already called those people in. The next day or a couple of days later, you can call those people yourself. Hey, did the manager call you in off the call and list? If the answer is no, and it probably will be, you can file that grievance at the driver rate. Think about that for a second. These people are making 40 something dollars an hour and you can get the double, triple, quadruple penalty on it. You're talking about 150, almost $200 an hour grievances. You can split, there's nothing wrong with setting it up. So you are the eyes and ears of it and you are splitting that money with the driver. I don't care if it's 50, 50, 60, 40, who's ever a better negotiator, whatever. That's a $200, $150 an hour grievance that you as a part driver can be doing the brunt of the work for and doing it under their pay rate and splitting it up. Nothing stops you from doing that. Now, will management eventually use that call in list? Maybe. But until they do, and, and that person should come in when they can. It's good money. Get it, shake them up. Make it happen. But this obviously is a long-term goal. It involves inside-outside networks. There's a lot to this. Um, so this is not the first grievance campaign you are doing. If you have one year on the job as a part-timer and you're not a shop steward yet, this might not be the first thing you need to do. But keep it in mind. And there's nothing wrong with just filing the grievances at your own rate for yourself based on what you see. Another type of grievance that deals with supervisors working specifically on the inside, name tags. We're gonna get a little bit more into this later. Some people like this, some people don't. Um, it's not a money grievance. It's not a grievance that necessarily matches up with the reality on the shop floor because you very well might know the supervisor and manager's names already. Um, just for, for everybody's knowledge, when you're writing a supervisor's working grievance, even if you don't know the manager's name and you don't know, um, if you don't know their name, right, and they're not wearing a name tag, but you want to write a supervisor's working grievance on them, you can absolutely describe them in the grievance and that's fine. Don't get cute or insulting about it, right? You don't need to, you know, say, you know, the bald guy with the acne, but you can say, you know, something that would designate who it is. Just be a little thoughtful that it's not too insulting. You don't want to open the door to be retaliated against. Um, but you can, you know, you could act, absolutely give some description of them. Um, you might not be able to request documents based on your status. Um, but in a lot of centers, recaps are going to be posted. Um, so it's helpful to be able to read them. So recaps are one of them. And then being able to read payroll records and time cards, even if you can't request it yourself, is going to be really helpful. Um, yeah, let me move on from there. I know it's a little fuzzy, but this is a payroll record. This is a very helpful thing to be able to read, particularly for 9-5 grievances. Because if you can read this right, right, violation of 9-5, three times in a week, if you've got payroll records, you can do it. Funny aside, we just had our um, local contract panel this past week. One of their labor managers couldn't read these. He thought that some, we have a coffee time bonus when you work over eight and a half in 804. 
and this dope thought that he could reduce 15 minutes from anybody's pay and not that it was on a separate line. So he lost that grievance and he looked like a moron. Um, you should not do that. You should know how to read these things. So the farthest left column here, even though it's fuzzy, that's going to be the package sent to the person sent. The next one's going to be their name, last name, first name. The next one is going to be their ID number. Um, after that is going to be the week ending date. After that is going to be the actual day of the week. After that, you see the words GTS. That's where the information was uploaded from. That's going to be the global time card system. I've heard different things over the years about whether the GTS can be altered or not. I'm not positive, but there is new language in the contract that if there's time card edits, they're supposed to be viewable. So if you have the ability to make requests because you're a business agent or you're a steward and, you're, and your contract allows for it, you're going to want to ask for the GTS and any edits to it because you want to see if a manager went in there and made edits. If they did and they shaved time, you just found your lottery ticket to get that manager fired or moved or something. Awesome. That's great. Request it. Bust them. Time shaving is a big deal. Find it. Um, the next column over is the pay code. I'm going to go into that in the next slide so you know how to read it. Um, the next column after that is going to be the time the person started. And the next column is the finish time. After that is going to be the breaks, which is normally lunch. So for very quick and dirty math um, to figure out how many hours a person worked that day, right? You're going to do the start time or you're going to start with the finish time, subtract the start time, subtract the hours, the um, unpaid time, right? So if it's, and this is all going to be military, by the way, and in clicks. So let's say it says, 2062, right? You're as the finish time, you're going to do that and you're going to subtract the break. You're going to subtract the start. And that's what's going to leave you with the total hours worked. If it's over 9.5, 9.5, that's a violation for the day of the 9.5 list. If there's three of them, just add it up. The column after that is fuzzy. I think that's bonus time, if I'm not mistaken. Um, the one after that is their codes for the type of work done. I'm not totally familiar with all of them, but some of them is going to be able to show if you're on the road. Some of them show if you're getting like a mileage bonus, if it's PVDs or feeder, you might see that one as a different code for um, how they're coming up with the rate. You'll also see if you have any sort of bonuses, like if coffee time, um, you'll see that for, for at least in NATO four, um, the column after that is actually going to be, I, I think that's the straight time hours. It's a little fuzzy. The overtime hours after that, um, you're going to see the rate of pay. You'll see it multiplied out. What you really want though, is from this, the most important things are going to be the hours themselves and the rate. Someone's asking about coffee time. I'm trying to do my best to talk about only national issues, but in different supplements, you might get bonuses for different sorts of things. So in 804, we get a we used to have a 15 minute coffee break for drivers. Now you just get an extra 15 minutes of pay anytime you work over eight and a half hours. To be clear, at least in 804, that does not count towards your nine five. It's actual hours worked. So don't leave any sort of bonus in there. That's why it's better to work off of the actual time you worked. Here are payroll codes, and this will be in your packet. This is across the country. The big ones to be able to know are going to be code 26 scheduled off. That cuts a, both of, that cuts a lot of ways for people. Scheduled off is supposed to be an unpaid day off. We are going to see that a lot 
um, particularly on the inside, but outside too. When management's selling days, hey, who wants a day off? We're over today. Being able to pick those out, those code 26s, they'll help you protect people that are in trouble for attendance at least the first couple of times. Because what you say to the manager is, hey, if you want this person to be coming to work, why the hell are you just giving them days off? You're sending them the wrong message. Stop with the code 26s, and then we can talk about some discipline for attendance. But we all need to take this seriously. We need to correct behavior. Scheduled off. Helps you with supervisors working grievances. Oh, we didn't have enough people that day. Sure you did, you sent them home, right? Really helpful for supervisor working grievances if they scheduled anybody off. Code six, I don't think it's on here. Code six, that is your pay guarantee. Everybody should be default code six, full-time and part-time. What does that mean? That means on the road, if you work less than eight hours, you should automatically get paid the difference between the time you actually worked and eight hours. Back to that last slide on the payroll codes, you're going to see DGUR. That's the code for a guaranteed pay. You are supposed to get it on the inside too. Three and a half hours. It is. I have seen that with part-timers before. Those are usually people who have harassed the hell out of their bosses to actually be coded that way. We are on day four of a national arbitration in local 804's jurisdiction to we're actually doing the three hour guarantee um which is a in the self in the national as a um memorandum of understanding we're trying to get everybody coded that way across the country see if it works um where it's unwaivable if it's under three someone posted code two that's a fun one that's a supervisor performing our work they are actually supposed to be putting in a code for that. If you are code two, you are a non-bargaining unit employee, likely a supervisor. That should be free money. If you see a recap with the code two, grieve it. That's a supervisor working. So people understand, if a supervisor is working, our argument as the union is that then the burden of proving that grievance shifts to the company. Hey, you're working. They need to show us the reason why it doesn't violate the contract. So grieve it. And if they can prove that there was a justified reason for work, oh, I actually was covering, covering a bathroom break. I wasn't just lying and saying I was covering a bathroom break. Look, it was only 15 minutes and that person was in the bathroom for those 15 minutes. Okay. That's a grievance that doesn't need to proceed any further. 99% of the time, it is going to be a valid grievance. Attendance. Attendance grievances, attendance discipline are not complicated. It is not the easiest to win, but it is not complicated. To beat a attendance discipline, a person needs to show improvement. Um, it's in the packet. This is an arbitration I took. Um, I don't think I gave you guys my background, by the way. So I'll do that really quickly right now. Um, I am currently the director of operations for Local 804, but I started at Local 804 in 2011 um, as the in-house attorney with Tim Sylvester. I held that position for five years. Then there was a change of leadership. I went and worked for 32BJ for three years. I did a ton of arbitrations there. Then I came back with Vinnie Perone in the very beginning of 2019 in a somewhat different role. Um, I still assist in every panel case. Um, I assist in arbitrations, but I don't actually have to do the legal work myself. It's great. I get to go into the buildings more. Um, it's very nice. But back then I was doing the arbitrations and I handled, I think it was a one day suspension for attendance and the art and we won. Um, we actually took a suspension for attendance all the way to an arbitrator. And we got a really nice decision in writing 
that can be referred to in future cases. And what it came down to, this guy had bad attendance. He was a driver. He had not good attendance for a driver. But, and the company followed progressive discipline, meaning it started with the warning. Everything starts with the warning. And what does that really mean? It means it's putting a person on notice. It's starting the clock on progressing discipline. The company can't discipline somebody if they didn't know it was wrong. What does that really mean though? There are certain types of things that everybody knows is wrong. So the company doesn't need to start at a warning. This should be common sense. If you steal, that doesn't start with a warning letter. Everybody knows that you can't steal. If you show up to work drunk or you are drinking on the job, you don't need to be warned first that that is not allowed. But attendance, what is acceptable attendance? That's a much fuzzier subject, right? We have sick days. We have days off. We can use them. That is totally fine. No call, no shows. I wouldn't accept a suspension on the first no call, no show that someone has, but I'd accept a warning on it, right? You should know that if you are unable to make it to work, do the right thing and call. Whether it's two hours before, or five minutes before, or day before, that all goes into, is this a verbal, is this you know, a, a written warning, is this accepted, is it not? Common sense, reasonableness. So you, someone has gotten a warning. How long did the company wait? Is this an inside employee that is late every day and is coming to work two or three days a week and the company waits six months until they have 80 lates and 20 no call no shows? If that's the case and they waited that long, that's where they're starting from. Okay, that is the first step. What is the next piece of discipline that they're trying to get someone to? And did they improve, right? That's, that's really what matters. So if someone in a five, if a, let's keep it easy, in a one month period, they had 10 days that they didn't come to work and 10 days late. In the next month, if they drop down to five days, they didn't come to work. And five days late, that is significant improvement. And I would not accept any discipline on that. If it's about the same, that's not showing any improvement. Can the company progress it? Should they say it? If they got a warning last time, maybe they get another warning. This is where you work your magic as a shop steward, right? This is where you don't let it get in front of an arbitrator or panel, but you figure it out but it is all about whether the person is improving or not, not whether if they're bad. You also want to really understand the time frame that we're talking about. I said a month and a month, right? You wanna be careful because the manager is going to wanna hit that person with discipline the very next time that they're out. That's not really fair, right? They waited six months to bring them in the office and then they wanna wait a week to bring them in the office again. Do your best to get cute, right? In six months, they had 40 absences. Having one absence in a week, well, that's a way better proportion. That is improvement. You always get their head spinning enough to buy the guy or girl another week. Pull them outside after. When nobody's looking, smack them upside the head and say, you need to come to work. Right? We do want people to come to work. What documents do you want to look at and be able to read? We mentioned the global, uh, I don't think we mentioned global time card too much before. Um, Pittsburgh, that's labor log. There's a lot of names for it. This is the global time card. That's what I had mentioned before. There is, um, there's a there's a version of this that actually has like a stamp on it. I've seen it before. Um, that one is definitely unalterable. This one, at least with the edits, you should be able to know. Just so you can see, you'll see at the very top, there's a report time, a scheduled start time. There's a lot of information in here. Just be familiar with it. This one is a little bit more self-evident to read than the payroll records, but you know it has your slick, it has your name, it has a lot of information in this. These should be 
relatively accessible. This is what a lot of people call a Pittsburgh, other people call it a labor log, but this will cover a year long period, right? You'll see the codes here, 15 called in, 22 holiday, 23 no call, personal. You'll see this person has pretty crappy attendance. Um, I, I believe we got this in the context of a one day suspension. Again, the key is improvement. Just because it looks like crap, that's fine. It gives you space to build off of it. But people do need to build off of it. It's helpful for you to be able to read this. If you see in some of this, you might see double stars in on some of them. Um, like if you look at the top line under June, if you scan across, there's a double star after the LT. That means there were two codes on that day. So maybe the person showed up late and there was some other sort of event on that day. That's what the double star means. The other ones are going to be the codes for what's actually happening on those days. The next page, this is the mentions that goes along with it. So you'll be able to see a better description on what is happening on those days and the manager could put in notes in the remarks. These will be presented at discipline. You could try to, if you're a shop steward, check in on people, you know, as you're going through it, check in on it as you're in the office. If you can take a picture of it, because you might be able to catch a manager in altering it. That will help you down the road. They are going to pretend that they are entering all this information as it goes. We know they're lazy. We know they're liars. So if you can get ongoing pictures of it as it goes, at least you will be able to show down the road that it is not contemporaneous, put in at the time, which means it's not as reliable when you get to a panel. The manager, or it is reliable, right? If a manager entered a note at a hearing as it was happening, it is much more likely that they got it right. If they are doing it three or more months later, because now they've progressed discipline on someone, and they want to put in only the self-serving remarks in there, you will at least know, hey, it was blank beforehand, and now you entered stuff after the fact, it's less reliable. Plus, it makes them look less reliable because you might have just caught them in some sort of lie, and you're going to want to do that. Every UPS manager is a liar, but it is hard to always catch them in it. Just because you catch them in it does not mean their boss is going to care because their boss got there by being a good liar, but an arbitrator might care. And that's what you're saving it for. I believe pretty much every panel, disciplinary panel across the country at this point will have a sitting arbitrator there. In my opinion, that is a good thing because they are not used to it the way internal management is. Contract panel, very few contract panels have sitting arbiters, arbitrators. So save some of that ammunition for later. Most contract panels are just going to deadlock anyway. Put in your documents there because you'll hear excuses down the road if you don't, but you could save the verbal arguments for down the road. Okay. Now we're gonna talk a little bit about kind of the more difficult um, campaigns and grievances to win and some best practices for them. The two ones that I think are really most important um, are gonna be Article 37, excessive overtime, request loads, also harassment. Article 37 is a really important and powerful um, section of the national agreement but it's gotta be enforced and it's hard to do it. So nine five list, how do you get people signed up? Um, I would normally kind of open the floor to experienced shop stewards at this point, because there's a lot of variation out there, but I can kind of do the broad strokes of what it takes. So there's a few approaches, right? Technically you could kind of sign everybody up, whether they want to or not, just put their name on the list and let them opt out. That cuts both ways. 
if you do not have an engaged membership in your shift, you don't want them pissed off at you. You don't want them feeling like you're putting a target on their back without their knowledge. Um, so talk to people. You also don't want to create targets. So you don't want to have only one or two people on the nine five list because then they are just going to stick out like sore thumbs. So you want to have as many people on that list as you can talk to people about it. Right now, you have people who were 22 fours for the last bunch of years that had no 9-5 protection whatsoever. They are probably really excited to get on the list. So that's probably right now where you want to start. Also, you can just tell them that it's, I mean, whether it's 100% true or not, everybody gets on the 9-5 list, right? Welcome to the 9-5 list. Get them on the list, right? If you just treat people like this is the normal culture, they will want to be a part of that culture. Get people on that 9-5 list. Get people signed up for request loads. We have them. There is There should be somebody in your center that wants to leave within eight hours in a given day. Get that. It, get people into the habit. The more people are into the habit of these things, the easier it is to continue it. We want people to use their rights. We want this enforced. It's important for everybody. Just because you might not have a need for it today doesn't mean you won't have a need for it down the road. So use that, right? Like you, you really want people negotiated hard for these rights. They're nice to have, use them. How do you enforce these things? We talked a little bit about it in the past, nine, five list. If you can read that payroll record, you can enforce it. If they're, cause this is black and white. If someone is on the list, and they get violated, they work more than nine five, that's money, right? It also triggers the meetings. This is also where, like I talked about at the beginning, the member who's on the list, and this also gets into how you get people signed up for it. Maybe they're not interested in working less than nine five, but we're all interested in extra money in our pocket. So if they get on the list and they are violated, that is extra money. Talk to them about it. Now, maybe you want to tell your manager the opposite because they're assholes, right? And they'll probably flip what people want. So for all the people who actually want to work for less than nine five, let the manager think that they're in it for the money and vice versa. Either way, get people on the list because then we can start winning the grievances. I know there's no longer 22-4. That's why you want to get everybody on the nine five list. But those are people who didn't even have that option before. Get them on the 9 5 list. So like I talked about, though, there is going to be management pushback. Get people prepared for it. The more people that are on the list, the harder it is for them to push back. Sparks report is a it's in there. Company actually uses it less than they used to. My understanding is they've integrated that system with the telematics system. So a lot of managers are really only using telematics these days. I like Sparks reports. I think they're easy to read. Um, so I'd still request them, but you might not get them the same way we used to. The biggest type of pushback you are going to get for a successful 9-5 campaign and a successful eight-hour guarantee campaign is they are going to accuse members of stealing time. Stealing time and production are very different things. The biggest difference is that stealing time is non-work activity while on the clock. That is different from dragging ass. If you are going too slow, you can get in trouble for production, but that is not stealing time. Stealing time is you are going into a restaurant, you are ordering and eating your lunch, you are not punching in a break. If you're smoking a cigarette, look busy while you're doing it. Don't take a full, full break without punching out for a break. 
they need to prove that you are performing non-work activity while you are on the clock. So that means for the most part, and there's language in the national to protect you against it, there should be, it can't just be the technology, right? It can't just be the telematics. Oh, I didn't see your truck move for 12 minutes. Oh, I, and there was no activity on your board. Bullshit. You could be in the back of your truck sorting your load. You could be doing lots of things that don't show up on their surveillance systems. So they need some sort of corroborative evidence. What does that look like? That could be a manager observation. That could be a ring camera, right? Arguably, I don't think a customer complaint is enough without that customer actually giving testimony. Um, but that gets closer right? To whether they can then use the technology too, that depends on the arbitrator, that depends on all of the things they're going to bring in. But they need it. Um, I attached an arbitration. That was actually the first arbitration I did for the Teamsters. And it was a good win, where it was a driver who they had the back of the truck closed. He was in the back of the truck for his lunch break. Management was there, but they could not see what he was doing. This was a very experienced member. He was on his lunch break. There was no work activity for, I, I don't remember, maybe it was an hour, 15 minutes, something like that. And they tried to fire him for the 15 or so minutes that his truck didn't move and there was nothing entered into his diet. He was a very smart driver. And he said... I was in the back of the truck. I was sorting my load. I was stretching and flexing. It was all work activity. It's a very good arbitrator. The arbitrator said, it's the company's burden to prove he was doing something other than working when he was had the door closed in the back of that truck. Arbitrator wrote in there, stretching and flexing is work. Sorting your load is work. Um, and he won significant back pay, that driver, with his job back. Be smart about it, right? Don't get too cute. Little cute's okay, though. You are going to want to force them to prove it, though. So when I say information requested, whether you get it or not, ask for it, ring the bell, be able to read it. Telematics looks like this, but it moves on their computers. If you see on the left-hand side, you see that, that red thing next to engine, that green thing next to seatbelt. This is showing near real time that someone's engine was off and their seatbelt was on. They have sensors to do this in near real time. You can request it. I have seen the, and they retain it. I've seen this be able to be played um, on a flash drive given to me. At the bottom, you can see all the stops going on. There is so much information in the telematics. It cuts both ways. You can call them out when they pretend they don't know something. You can ask for it and use it to help you at panel. Generally, you are going to have to be a business agent to get this stuff, but it is really good to be able to call them out. On, on what they actually have and being able to read it yourself. This is also really what they use the most these days. This is information both from the truck and the board. They now can link it together and see it in near real time. That was, I think, in the, in the newest dyad, they were able to really update all this stuff. We are gonna do a Q&A session now. Um, we're about 55 minutes in, so, Let's see what people have. After this, we'll be talking about writing grievances, um, but this kind of covered the broad strokes of uh, best practices. All right, thanks, Josh. Uh, we got a couple of good questions. Um, I have one, I don't know if you saw it, <laughs> but you keep referring to the recap, uh, and I'm not sure everybody understands what that is, if you could possibly explain what that is. Yes, and I should have included an example in it um, but a recap, you know what, if I can, 
you know what, let me stop sharing screen for a second and and see if I can find one. Um, hold on one second. So let me see if I can buh, 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 quickly find a recap for you guys. But what a recap is, it's a daily recap. And there is information that is both inside and outside. Um, you should be able to see it. Let me let me see what I got. Um, and it it gives each person. It shows the type of work they did. It shows how long they did it. There is and in most centers that is going to be posted in the bulletin board. If it is not posted, um, and we're going to get to it in a little bit, you as a, the shop steward has the right to post things in the union bulletin board. Shop steward also has the right to view recaps. I'm not against putting it up so people can see their own information. Um, I think there's a lot of good stuff in the recap for you to work off of. Give me, if, uh, Greg, if you want to, though, ask more questions, I'm going to continue to look for it. Let me see what I can find. All right. So we have a question here about penalty pay. Mm -hmm. uh, penalty pay is incorrect on multiple weeks in a row. Does penalty pay apply each week? It's not correct or just once. So penalty pay is one that there's two types of penalty pay. There's penalty pay on an underpayment of wages. And then there's penalty pay on grievances, which have been agreed to be paid, which are then not paid. So in the first instance, I think it's easiest to argue when there's really just a pay shortage, right? So if you are underpaid, put in the grievance, the next pay period, and then you don't have to keep refiling that grievance. It should just keep growing. Um, the other one is a little bit more complicated because, right, you actually should have a re written grievance that very clearly shows it's upheld. We don't always get those so easily. Um, but that that is kind of, does that answer the question? Greg, could you you tell me? Did that answer the question? I think, I think the question uh, is whether you need to file it if they're continually underpaying you week after week. Should you yeah. file another grievance each week with penalty pay? I would I would say no, but I would also, if it really is is lasting like months, I think it's common sense to just keep re-upping it to prove because the company might lie and say that you were satisfied at some point and you weren't. So just to prove that it's an ongoing issue, I would probably refile it. Um can everybody see this? This is a recap. So this is drivers. And the reason I know that is because if you go halfway across the page, you'll see the word S-P-O-R-H that stops per on-road hour. And that is a very common production standard used by management and somewhat accepted by arbitrators in the sense that they will, on an OJS ride, um, take your spore and put it down and try to hold you to some version of spore. But if you work on the inside, you're not going to have spore because you don't have stop. You're not on road, right? So if that section is blank, we're talking about insiders. If that section has information in it, we're talking about drivers. The one next to it, other work hours, that's going to be where the inside stuff is. So that might be, you know, you could see across the top with some of it, some of it, you could see CLRK, that's query clerk work, PRLD is query preload work. If there's something in both, that's a combo, right? If there's something only in the other, you could dig a little bit deeper to see what it is. Um, but this is the recap. It has a whole bunch of information on it, as you can tell. This is, I saw someone in the chat earlier, where you see the TC pay codes, top one is 17, below that is six, the six is the guarantee. This is where you're gonna be wanting to look for those code twos. If you look one, two, three, four, five up from the bottom, boom, that's a supervisor working. Code two, read it. Not every right. 
now their supervisor is going to put that in there. But I think that's uh, that's it for the time being, Josh. We're going to move on. Okay. We'll have some more Q and A at the end. Okay, cool. So let me stop sharing this one and let me go back to sharing the. Uh, blah, 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 blah. I have too many things open. Hold on one second. Give me one sec. I shouldn't have risked that. Okay. Let me close this one. I got it. And here we go. Moving on. Let me full screen this. Okay. I don't remember how to full screen it. Let me move on. Oh, oh, here we go. Great. Okay. Now we are going to get into the nitty gritty of writing agreements. So as I said before, it does not matter what the form is. At 804 on our website, we have what I think is a very easy to read and fill one page form um, that lays this stuff out. But again, it could be on a piece of toilet paper as long as it has the valid information. I like one page forms. I'm just gonna say quickly, I don't like two pagers. I don't like it overly complicated. I like short, sweet and to the point, but that's my preference. What needs to go on your grievances? Date of the violation date you first raised it with management and any other steps. Why are these dates so important? Because the easiest defense for management is timeliness. They are going to say it was untimely, even if it was on time, if you can't prove it, because that just gets it thrown out. So those dates are going to be super important. It's going to be super important also because down the road, this is going to pass through many hands. They might they might not want to constantly call you to figure out pieces of it. Make it easy. Make it easy for both the union reps. Make it easy for the company. What happened? Let's use supervisor working grievance as an example. I want to see more than supervisor worked. I want to see who was the supervisor. What type of work were they doing? How long were they doing it? I love it when I see a grievance that says Joe Blow was at the Red Belt from 545 to 6 a.m. sorting packages. I got everything there. And I just said it in one simple sentence, right? The name of the person, the type of work they were doing, where they were in the building, how long they were doing it. Boom. All there. Easy to read. Verifiable. The management knows it, right? That's good. You don't need more than that. You don't do less than that, though, please. What sections of the contract were violated? Don't kill yourself on this. Just if it's supervisor working, right? 3-7. Make sure that something is in there that says and all others that apply. It's implied that that's going to be there. But if you write it, it is going to make it easier for everyone down the road whether it's a shop steward, business agent, or lawyer, you are on the shop floor writing this grievance. You do not need to know everything under the sun. Someone else might want to add something down the road. What's the remedy? Make sure you are clear on it. Do you want money? Is it a harassment grievance? Do you want it a written apology? Do you want the money available at national panel? What do you want? Do you want to cease and desist? Put it in there. It's really important because you know what? If you don't have it in there, there's the rare chance that you have a good faith manager that actually wants to resolve something. Tell them what will resolve it. If you are talking about harassment and an apology will do it, let it be in there. Maybe you'll get it. Maybe not, but you won't get it if you don't say what it is. If you have evidence to attach, attach it not just for management, but for the people handling this down the road. If you've got the recap, attach it. This is going to help everyone down the road. If you have put in an info request, whether it was filled or not, attach it. Because now 
down the road, arbitrator, whomever, when's the first time this was requested? You have it in there. Give your business agent or lawyer or whomever. We've been asking for this from day one, especially if let's say management throws it in the garbage. Oh, we didn't know the, the union wanted this. Bullshit. We've been asking for it from day one. And if you've got a record of it, even better. To that last point, you are making extra copies of everything you do. I'd like to believe that there are no more business agents left in the Teamsters that are throwing out your grievances. Have an extra copy just in case there are. I'd like to believe there are no business agents that lose grievances. Have an extra copy just in case they do. I absolutely believe there are still managers that throw these out and that lose them. Make an extra copy for when they do. Grievance campaigns. A lot of what we've been talking about has kind of been individual grievances. You're filing it for yourself. Um, you're filing it for a single member. Those are great and those are winnable. It is way better to build a grievance campaign because here's the thing. We are all going to lose individual grievances. Lawyers are going to lose individual grievances. Members are going to lose them. And I don't mean losing the piece of paper. I'm going to mean having them ruled against us. It happens, right? It should happen. If it never happens, to, then you're not being aggressive enough. File grievances. File grievances that are on the edge. It is okay and expected to lose them because we are all pushing. Everybody who showed up on a Sunday here is an activist that is pushing. So keep pushing. So that being said, when you lose an individual grievance and it's just for yourself, maybe you learn something out of it. But if it's part of a campaign, you can actually still win something, even if that individual grievance got lost because you got people involved, you got people knowledgeable, you got people willing to see that even if it's not a good grievance, that retaliation didn't happen because enough people got involved. So when we're doing a grievance campaign, we are building solidarity. We are picking an issue that matters to people, right? You do not build a campaign around someone that no one, that nothing, about an issue that no one cares about because you're not going to get people involved. And even if you win, nobody's going to care. And we want to win. We want to involve members and we want to win. But winning doesn't just look like a paycheck. Winning looks like giving people the ability to feel like they have power on the job, to feel like they are not under attack, that they have strength. So that is a big part of what we do. So what are some examples, right? You are a brand new shop steward. You are in a part of the operation where people are completely unengaged. You are replacing a shop steward that has not done anything for years. So you might have a lot of people that have never picked a vacation in seniority order, that have never gotten to have their summer vacation, right? Take it over. This is the type of thing that also your manager is probably lazy and doesn't want to do it themselves. So if you are a brand new shop steward, go to your manager. Hey, can I do the vacation picks? And then you also, here's what's important too. You can do something that the manager can't do, which is, and something you should push back on. The 20 year guy that, the 20 year guy that always picks the same week in August every year, and you know they always pick the same week, that is sitting on that vacation picks for weeks and not letting the next person go, you can say, hey, I'm putting down that week you always take and giving it to the next person. Move on. If you want to change it, come back to me. But we got to pass this thing. Now, I would never let a manager do that to your top seniority guy and disrespect him that way. But you're the shop steward. You can do it. So move it down the road, and then you are going to have members get something that they never had before, which is efficient vacation picks, and you're probably not even going to have to file a grievance to make that happen. You just did a campaign. You got people something that they didn't have before. Another one, the union bulletin board. 
use it, right? This is something that is in the contract. I'm going to skip ahead for a second. Article 19 of the National. It's in there. You're the steward. You should have a key. The employer can't mess with it. Put in some good information in there that people might want to read. You just established control on the shop floor. You just established power on the shop floor as a shop steward. That is really important. You need to do that. Name tags we talked about really slightly. One thing I like about name tags is it just shows you can get management to do something they don't really want to do. Doesn't get anybody that much, but it does give you that little flex because this is a winnable one. It is black and white. I like it for that purpose. Excessive overtime, supervisors working. That's a tough one to build up to you, but it's a really good one. Um, so article 19, I really like the posting in the boards because it's a way to get information to the members. It gives you power. It gives you a key. It makes you more of an equal on the shop floor, which is something that you need to be reminding management of. 36 and 37 are really powerful language. You got to build up to it. But these are the campaigns that everybody needs to do and really matters to a lot of people pushing back on harassment, request loads, um, excessive overtime. That's the stuff that that's there, but you got to be able to win those and you got to understand that those are long-term campaigns. Um, we are going to skip the next Q&A. I think that people are going to have the ability to email some stuff and we'll do some back and forth to, to best answer those questions. Um, also, come to the uh, TDU convention. I am going to be there. I'm going to be teaching a different class there. I am going to be happy to talk to people there um, about any questions you might have. Oh, I am so sorry. I also wanted to, in talking about these grievance campaigns, Carlos Silva is here to actually give some anecdotes of on the job. So now is the time. I shouldn't have done. I'm going to go back to the slide where I should have thrown it to Carlos. Carlos, you're up. All right, thanks, Josh. You guys see me? No, let me turn your camera on, Carlos. Let me see. Up oh, there you are. All right. All right, good morning, everyone. My name is Carlos Silva. I'm out here in Southern California in Gardena. I am a shop steward. I've been a shop steward for over 10 years. Uh, we filed a grievance here. It was a safety grievance in regards to our parking lot. It was a group grievance. Uh, let me explain a little bit about that. Uh, a couple of Christmas ago, uh, UPS in our building decided to improve their parking lot for their trailers. So they took away our employee parking to make it the UPS trailer parking. They bought an area next to our employee parking and it was an old parking lot for buses. So they gave us that parking lot. The parking lot was not in good conditions. Uh, there was not good lighting. There was no striping on the ground for us to park. It was horrible. So why ended up happening was that people decided to park across the street from the employee parking. There's a, there's a shopping center with a supermarket and several other stores and it was a better parking, so people started deciding to park across the street. So during Christmas over here, it gets a little bit dark, right? So people have to jaywalk across the street in order to get to the car. Uh, unfortunately, two UPS drivers got hit. One went to the hospital, broke his legs, arms, that source. And unfortunately, the older gentleman actually passed away. He got hit while standing in the sanding divider or the middle of the road by a UPS driver who didn't see him. UPS is not an active company, it's a reactive company. So they automatically went out there and they blame us because we're not parking in the UPS parking lot. They actually hire a part-time supervisor to be out there on an everyday basis to harass old employees uh, because they were jaywalking. They were telling them that 
they can't jaywalk. If they jaywalk, they're going to get uh, disciplined. They're going to get warning letters. So they were harassing, intimidating people to do all that. The shop stewards in Gardena, we went out there. We talked to the supervisors. They didn't want to stop doing what they were doing. So we filed a grievance. We got a petition going. We got over two, 300 signatures on that petition. We went to the police. We asked for the definition of jaywalking. We went to the Gardena City Council to talk to them to help us out. We got all that information. We filed the grievance. We gave it to both management. We gave it to the safety uh, manager and we had the meeting. We filed multiple article 37s on the other people who supposedly got disciplined for jaywalking. So with all that, we went to the meeting with all that information that we have and received, just to let you know, by all the, all the information that we got from the police, from the city council and the petition, it was a winning grievance. Within six months, UPS fixed, they repaved, the new striping in the parking lot, new lighting, and they became, our parking lot became well lit and safe for the employees to park. So sometimes it takes all of that for you to win a grievance. And it's a group grievance. It takes effort and time and everybody to get involved in order to win. That is my time. Man. Thank you, Carlos. Wrong button. Yeah, start my video. Okay. So as you can see, right, that's that's what a win looks like, but it wasn't just the specifics of it, right? It's about the fact that a bunch of members got involved. They put in the work, and then having a win, right? I'm sure those members were so much more willing to get involved in the next campaign. They were able to stand that much taller after that, which is part of the point. It's not just the win in of itself, but it's what you can build off of that. And that's really what we're getting at. Here's the thing that I wanna go through quickly too, and then we're gonna wrap it up. Just understand what the procedure is and what it takes if you can't get it resolved at each step. So we're going to start, right, this is non-disciplinary grievance. This is a violation of national language, right, of the white pages of your contract. So, for example, a harassment grievance. We have a harassment grievance. I'm going to D.C. tomorrow to argue a harassment grievance that took, since I think it was filed in 2019. We had a manager tell a driver um, that's what it was like when I was raping your mother last night. And another manager simulated that next to him in an office with two OMSs and two other drivers there. That grievance has not been settled yet because we haven't gotten the remedy we want yet. The company has said that they acknowledge they violated it, and that's not good enough, right? We want the pay out of it. We want to drag this guy through the mud. We don't have the right to fire him, but we want to ruin him any way we can. So that gets filed by, I'm using this as an example because we're going next week to do it. So that happens. The driver files the grievance. The manager apologizes to him, but it's not good enough. So then we take it to local panel. Okay. We presented it local panel and the, company puts on whatever silly case they have. Oh, he feels bad. It should be dropped. We say, not good enough. We want a written apology and we want the pay. We want the pay available under the contract. They call up their lawyers. They call up the national. Oh, we don't know if we can issue the pay yet at our level. That might only be issued at national. Okay, then the grievance isn't over yet. By the way, in this specific one, they tried to claim that because they wrote upheld on the grievance, we weren't allowed to go farther. We actually had to go to an arbitrator to say, no, it's the union's grievance. They can go after whatever remedies available under the contract. So we kept pushing. 
So it goes grievance on the shop floor, meet with the manager at that level, meet with the labor manager at a higher level, go to local panel, deadlock there, go to national panel, present at national panel, because it's an article 37. There will be a sitting arbitrator at the national panel to make the decision. For anybody interested in this case, we actually got a little cute with how we filed it because it on the docket, you write out the issue. Normally, the issue would be, did the company violate Article 37 by harassing so-and-so? We said, let's maximize the embarrassment. So if you look at this year, this month's docket, this quarter's docket, one of the things on the docket written out is, did Tom Gulen violate the contract when he told the member he was fucking his mother? And that's what's going to be read at panel. That's what everybody can see written at panel, because this guy needs to be embarrassed. If it was not a harassment grievance where there's a sitting arbitrator, when it deadlocks at national panel, it then gets assigned to a national arbitrator who the lawyers will get involved. It's similar to going to court. They will do a written decision from start to finish. That can take years. So I'm talking about a 2019 grievance that's getting heard now. If it was going to a national arbitrator, it would deadlock a panel, get scheduled three or four months from now, multiple hearing dates, another eight months, maybe a year, depending on how many hearing dates there is. That's the reality of it. I see it's unacceptable. That's the reality of it. Um, we all do the best we can to speed up these processes, but they are not fast processes. So you want to make sure your grievances are well written, they're well put together, and you set everybody up to win, or at a minimum, you make the company as miserable as we are or more at every step of this. Keep pushing them, keep building the pressure, keep building your leverage. If you can get it resolved earlier for an acceptable remedy, do that, right? But at a minimum, make them miserable. At that point, I am going to turn it over to Greg, and we will close this out. Hopefully, I will see all of you in Chicago. Thanks for coming. All right. Thanks, Josh, for that wealth of information. I hope everybody learned something. I know I did. Um, just to wrap up, uh, you're going to get a feedback form texted to you at the end of this webinar. Uh, we ask that you please fill it out. Let us know your thoughts on today's webinar. There were a lot of folks that left questions in the Q&A. Obviously, we couldn't get to all of them. Um, you can respond to that and put that on that form, and somebody from TD will reach out to you uh, with an answer. Um, and if you found this webinar informative and helpful, uh, you can help TDU to continue these programs with a donation, or even better, become a member of TDU and join the rank and file movement. Uh, once again, the TDU convention will be November 3rd through 5th in Chicago. Please visit tdu.org to register. Um, I strongly encourage all of you to attend, and I look forward to meeting all of you in person. Uh, thanks to everyone for taking the time to join today's webinar. Uh, thank you for taking an active role in your union, and please enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Thanks, everyone.